In the extreme south of Bangladesh, the Sundarbans region is one of the most vulnerable in the world. The inhabitants live close to the water's edge. When the sea rises, pushed by the wind, dikes break and waves rush inland. The villagers spend their time reinforcing them, a never-ending job. Mohammed lives on the island of Gabura in the Sundarbans. Over the years, he has seen its surface area shrink rapidly. His village has just been engulfed by water. Nilufa also lives in Gabura. She miraculously survived the last cyclone that killed 26 people, including some of her family. The water is constantly at the doors of her house. Yes! Her household is struggling. With global warming, devastating storms are hitting this region more regularly. Each time, the damage is considerable. The seawater destroys both houses and crops. This salt water, which regularly floods the grounds, impacts the entire economy of the Sundarbans. When the sea withdraws, the soils are full of salt, impeding any growth. The rice fields that used to shape the landscape have completely disappeared. In order to survive, farmers like Abdul, 62 years old, have had to change jobs. Nowadays, there are only shrimp farms as far as the eye can see, which are much less profitable. Sadly, the old man can't even afford to eat his own shrimp. Every year in Bangladesh, around 700,000 people lose their homes to natural disasters. Bangladesh is the country in the world most at risk from rising waters. It could lose one-fifth of its surface area by 2050. Located on the Ganges Delta, a large part of Bangladesh is totally flat. The whole south could disappear. 60 million Bangladeshis are in danger of water submersion, one person out of three. But the interior of the country is also threatened. An increase in the frequency of storms added to the violent monsoon rains cause huge floods. The 21 million inhabitants of the capital, Dhaka, are not spared. From north to south, the rivers are rising dangerously and devouring the banks. <laughs> As 
As a result, millions of climate refugees are rushing to the capital to find any available job. Some join garment workshops. Bangladesh has become the world's factory. Four million workers produce the jeans, t-shirts and shoes that the Western world wears. But the manufacture of these cheap clothes is a disaster for the environment. Every day, tons of toxic waste are thrown back into nature. In the long run, you know, it causes cancer. But this prosperous industry, so harmful to public health, has also allowed Bangladesh to build a flourishing economy. A new middle and upper class has emerged. Swimming pool, uh, Ready to buy up properties. In 2024, the country is predicted to be removed from the list of developing countries. Now, thanks to committed entrepreneurs, the first model companies are emerging. Even shipbreaking yards, which used to be highly polluting, are going green. Everything that falls, uh, all the waste is centrally connected. Investigation into Bangladesh, a country threatened from all sides, fighting daily for its survival and where beautiful stories inspire hope. Our investigation into the consequences of global warming in Bangladesh begins in Dhaka. Depending on the year, between 50,000 and 300,000 victims of natural disasters come to the capital in search of work. Every day they disembark by the dozens at the seaport or railway station. Today, Dhaka is one of the most congested and densely populated cities in the world. Most of the climate refugees are housed in makeshift hotels in the many slums of the megalopolis. All of them left home with minimal belongings. Korban Ali, 65 years old, arrived a few weeks ago and is staying with 35 other people in this single room of about 40 square meters. His dramatic story is very common here. <laughs> Korban Ali pays one euro twenty per day for food and lodging. Korban Ali is a rickshaw driver a three-wheeled cab bike that he rents for one euro twenty a day. The climate refugee works over 12 hours a day for three months straight before returning to his family. After paying for the hotel and his rickshaw, he has between two to five euros left in his pocket, the profit from an average of 30 errands done each day. What little money he has saved Korban Ali sends every three to four days by money order to his wife and two sons, who are still students. 
Bangladesh already has six million climate refugees like Korban Ali. The rickshaw driver comes from Kurigram, another region extremely affected by the devastation of water. Located in the very north of the country, far from the sea, fresh water flows from the gigantic rivers of the Brahmaputra and the Ganges, referred to as Padma in Bangladesh. They are the source of much struggle. Overflowing due to the melting of the Himalayan ice as a result of global warming, the flow of rivers has increased significantly. As a consequence, the erosion of river banks has dangerously accelerated. Each year, thousands of houses are destroyed, and entire villages disappear underwater. The island of Karya on the Brahmaputra has just been hit hard, in spite of the sandbags supposed to protect it. The businesses that were still standing are now mostly closed. This was the case for this school that catered for up to 900 students. Now, not much remains of it. Of the 14 classrooms, only two are still in use. These disasters have destroyed schools and businesses, but also cultivable land, which has caused the poverty rate to rise. Today, families are finding it more and more difficult to feed and raise their children, who have become a heavy financial burden. As a consequence, to reduce costs, more and more young girls are married off at a very young age, and their husbands are even paid between 500 and 1,000 euros to take them away. One of the heartbreaking consequences of global warming. Vegetables, fish, and meat. In this Fish class of third graders, several teenagers all are already married, Fish like Jasmine, who has just turned 15. Her husband is a young peasant from the island, and even though Jasmine was opposed to his marriage, she had no choice in the matter. Most of these young women will soon be out of school. Their husbands don't have enough money to pay for their education. These child marriages are officially forbidden by the government. They take place in secret so there are no celebrations. A family who has just married off their daughter agreed to meet us. Sabina is 13 years old. She's in the sixth grade. 
অবস্থার কারণে বাধ্য হয়েছি আমার লেখাপড়া করে ইচ্ছে ছিল বড় হওয়ার ইচ্ছে ছিল চাকরি করতাম তারপরে বিয়ে করতাম মানে ডিমেন দিবের বাড়ি নিয়ে কোনো না বসি বড় হলে তো বেটিকার দিবের বান আমার যোগ্য মতন দিবের বান নয় একটু সবাই ভালো পাচ্ছি দিয়ে দিয়ে ফেলাচ্ছি এই বিষয়ে তো দেওয়া না হলে তো আর দিলাম না কিছু সংসার থাকিল মানে লেখাপড়া বেশি করাই লোক চাকরি নিয়ে দিল এটা তোর পাই নাই অভাবের কারণে Sabina's husband works far away from the island, and he has agreed to let her stay with her parents for the time being, and has promised to pay for her education, as the teenager's mother does not work and her father, a farmer, has lost his land. Sabina's father realized that his daughter was unhappy and said he regretted his decision. Some little girls would be married by the age of nine. To try to put an end to this scourge, the principal of a nearby elementary school decided to write a strong message on the wall of his school. আমার যেটা ইয়া যাতে একটা শিশু বিয়ে হলে শিশুটা সে তো শিশুই কিন্তু সে তার নিজের নিজের শরীর সম্পর্কে নিজের পড়ালেখা সম্পর্কে নিজের ভালো সম্পর্কে জানে না পরবর্তীতে যখন বিয়ে হয় অবস্থায় তখন দেখা যায় যে ওই শিশুটার প্রতি এমন একটা ভার চাপে তখন তার মনে কাছে স্বামী সংসার শ্বশুর শাশুড়ি নিয়ে বিশাল একটা ঝামেলা পড়ে এবং এ ব্যাপারে দেখা যায় যে অনেক শিশু অপুষ্টিতে ভোগে তারপরে হলো যে অল্প বয়সে তখন তখন তারা বাচ্চা নেয় in Bangladesh, teenage mothers are five times more likely to die during childbirth. These clandestine child marriages are not registered anywhere and carry no value. This is confirmed by the official office of Muslim marriages. According to UNICEF, one out of two women in Bangladesh is married before her 18th birthday, the legal age. That's the highest rate in the world. Not only are young women at risk from these marriages, the rivers also threaten the lives of young children. Every year, more than 14,000 children die from drowning. Are you ready? One, two, three. It's the number one cause of death, not including disease, for young people. Sohag has been a swimming teacher for five years. He works for an NGO that constructs swimming pools with bamboo and places them in ponds. Sohag also noticed that the water was rising dangerously. Accidents often happen at a certain time of the day. 
মানে সকাল থেকে ছয়টা থেকে আটটা অবধি তারা নিজেদের কাছে রাখে তারপরে ওই যে রান্না বান্নার কাজ যখন বেজে যায় বা বিভিন্ন ধরনের কাজে ব্যস্ত থাকে বারোটা পর্যন্ত বা সাড়ে বারোটা পর্যন্ত এই সময়টুকুতে বাচ্চাদের কাজ থেকে মা বাবাটা একটু ছড়ে গেলেই এই দুর্ঘটনাটা বেশি হয়ে থাকে The NGO also teaches the children how to help with what they have nearby when a person is drowning. It takes about 15 lessons for a child to be able to swim and rescue his or her classmates. As a reward, they receive a very flashy T-shirt, supposed to promote their new skills. আশেপাশে তোমাদের বন্ধু বান্ধব যারা আছে স্কুলে যারা আছে সবাইকে বলবা যে এই সেন্টারে এসে যেন সাঁতার শিখে ঠিক আছে Shapla and Abdul live a few minutes away from the pond where the swimming lessons take place. A few months ago, their only daughter died from drowning. <laughs> Aisha was five years old. Her father had given her 10 cents to go and buy sweets with her seven-year-old cousin, who also died. Aisha is buried a few steps from the pond. Abdul regularly visits her grave. Today in Bangladesh, more and more people are trying to raise awareness about the tragedies of climate change. We go to the Fashion Institute in Dhaka. Vijay, a 24-year-old student, is working on his impressive final project. I said, I said to her that he, she is also doing the ramp. I was like pulling out her legs. The school has 5,000 students. It's the most modern in the country. This afternoon, Vijay is finalizing his masterpiece. Okay, ready. It's your perfume? Yes, it's my perfume. Came from Italy. <laughs> this cloud hat resembles a cyclone. It's supposed to warn about the consequences of global warming as a result of human activity. I think the nature is very beautiful, very beautiful to all of us. So we're destroying it. But if we are going to show the nature after 100 years, I think everything will be extinct. Vijay is aware that the fashion industry he hopes to work for will also contribute to the destruction of his country's nature. A few meters away from the university, the student's canteen is a bit different. Vijay receives a price tag from a foreign brand instead of a fork. 
I'm meeting with the like price tag from the garments industry. It's like having the sign of the dollars and the price. So the it is a garments waste, I think. It's come from the garments and roam around the world and go with the land. These forks alone sum up the other big problem in Bangladesh, extreme pollution, particularly from the fashion industry. In just a few years, Bangladesh has become the most polluted country in the world. The historic center of Dhaka has become an open-air dumping ground, where garbage is sometimes dumped directly into the rivers. Pinaki, an investigative journalist, is a specialist in environmental issues. I talked with very old people and they said they used to catch fish here, they used to take swim. But nowadays, if you take bath here, I think you will be, you know, very sick within half an hour. According to Pinaki, the fashion consumers of the world are also responsible for this pollution. People from Europe, people from other developed countries like America and uh, people from North, they realize or not, uh, but I would say they are also contributing to our river pollution because, you know, they always want cheap clothes and due to their cheap clothes, nothing is cheap. So if you want cheap clothes and that, that's how you're polluting our river. With 5,000 factories that bring in over $30 billion of income per year, Bangladesh is the second largest manufacturer of clothes in the world, just after China. This afternoon, Pinaki goes to the outskirts of Dhaka. He has heard about a new ecological scandal related to the leather industry. The Dalashwari River is in danger. In Dhaka, it is already, already too late. All the rivers are dead, already biologically dead. Pinaki hopes that his investigation will help save the river. In recent years, 185 tanneries have set up along its banks. 80% of the hides produced here are exported and supply the ready-to-wear shoe and leather goods industries worldwide. A sewage treatment plant has been built, but this one, saturated, would not hesitate to pour its tanks into the Dalashwadi. As soon as he arrives on site, Pinaki is immediately followed by a security agent. The lead that he received seems to be correct. This pipe leads directly from the sewage treatment plant. It's supposed to be treated, but it is not treated. I can, I can see it in my bare eyes that this water is not treated. This is pure black water and it is stinky. So it is polluting the river. A group of people in charge of the water treatment plant quickly arrive and call out to the journalist. I'm, I'm talking to him. The manager tries to convince Pinaki that these discharges are just an exception. Explanations that do not convince the journalist. I don't think that's true. I can see the color of the water, I can smell the water, and I think it is polluted. According to his research, the water treatment plant has many flaws. Problem is, uh, sometimes industries from here, they produce, uh, you know, more liquid waste than the capacity. So during that time, this, Central ETP, it doesn't work. So some of the waste, it has to go directly to the river. Pinaki also discovers that the plant was not designed to treat certain very dangerous heavy metals, such as chromium, which is used to protect the leather from rotting during the tanning process. 
this EPP is not designed to, you know, treat chromium. So if the chromium comes here, it goes to the river and it goes to the open environment. Then the chromium will be in the fish, then the, in the plants. Uh, in the long run, it causes several diseases, but in the long run, you know, it causes cancer. When absorbed or inhaled, chromium can cause cancer of the respiratory tract, nasal cavity, kidneys, and bladder. After several requests, a tannery finally agreed to open its doors to us. It's so stinky. Inside, we notice that the workers are handling the leather without any protection. The workers, they are exposed to, exposed to all this. They are working bare hand without any shoes. So that's how, you know, and this leather, these are treated with highly toxic chemical. So this is harmful for their health, obviously. The manager of the tannery tries to minimize the dangers. A statement that once again does not convince the journalist. Maybe that's what they were told, that these chemicals are not uh, harmful, so that's what he believed, but I don't think so. But this is not the last surprise in store for Panaki. As he leaves the tannery, tractors loaded with leather scraps catch his eye. They have started dumping it here, so I'm going to check. 200 meters further on, the journalist discovers a frightening sight. Tens of tons of leather scraps, soaked with toxic chemicals, are burned in the open air only a few meters from the river. Basically, I'm worried, you know, because they are not supposed to dump it here in this way. So it was a basically a lowland a sort of pond. So they have filled up that pond already. So now they're dumping it here. So I'm worried that what will happen after six months or after three months. So maybe they will start dumping it down there. The air full of toxic fumes is unbreathable. Already I'm feeling some headache here. What about the ecological consequences on the river? Near the tanneries, fish seem to be scarce. To confirm this, we go to a fishing village located downstream from the factories. Here, all the men are fishermen, from father to son. But for months, the nets have been dry. Gabindo and his wife pray every day that their situation will improve. <laughs> Before the tanneries, Gabindo earned between 10 and 20 euros a day. Today, his small jobs in the fields bring him barely five. 
Of the 100 families that used to live here, only 15 are left. As for the leather industry, it is the second largest source of income in the country, with 1 billion euros of revenue in 2018. These leather and garment factories employ over 4 million people in the country. They have allowed Bangladesh to experience an exceptional growth of over 7% for several years. The country is developing at a high speed, but the environment is rarely the priority. Bangladesh needs roads, so to build them, an astonishing but very polluting business has been set up. To melt the tar, workers burn tons of fabric scraps. Golab is the site manager. What is this, sir? <laughs> Are you looking at it? It's a jute. It's a garment jute. That's garment white. Yes, garment white. Jute. This is a very environmentally unfriendly method, but it's widely used. For this hard work amidst toxic fumes and financed by the government, the workers earn 60 euros per month. Many have health problems. Every piece of clothing made in Bangladesh indirectly contributes to the construction of roads. The country's textile factories produce more than 500,000 tons of waste each year, more than half of which is not recyclable. This small fabric scraps business operates directly at the foot of the factories. The bags of scraps are bought at a few cents per kilo from the factories. Once sorted, two-thirds of the scraps will be sold for recycling, and one-third will be used as fuel for road construction. Many big international brands, like Gap, Zara, and Bershka, are behind these fabric scraps. But in Bangladesh, not everything is like this in the textile industry. More and more companies are going green. After several weeks of negotiations, a so-called green factory opened its doors to us. It's a two-hour drive from Dhaka and employs 7,300 people. Since the collapse of the Rana Plaza in 2013, an eight-story building in very poor condition that housed several garment workshops, the sector has feared journalists. The disaster left 1,135 people dead, mostly seamstresses. The factory we are going to visit is an example to follow. It shows that a part of the country is listening after the shock of Rana Plaza. Sirajul is one of the directors of the Batopi Group, which owns the factory.
The group manufactures clothing for Decathlon, Promod, and H&M. The factory has been awarded the coveted platinum designation by the powerful United States Green Building Council. It is one of the 10 greenest clothing companies in the world. The factory washes over 60,000 garments a day. Saving water was one of its priorities. Sirajul is accompanied by Mahbub, its sustainability manager. Minimize the water consumption. We introduce this ozone machine, and uh, it will save around uh, 70 liters of, of water per kg garments production. Also to save water and chemicals, the artificial wear of the jeans is now done by laser. Outside, the wastewater is all reprocessed. Uh, this water is from our inlet channel. This is actually the main raw wastewater. And here, after optimizing the bio level of water, we are finally discharging into the environment. While most of the recycled water is discharged into a nearby canal, 10% is reused locally. At Bitopi, everything is recycled, even the leftovers from the canteen, where 3,000 people eat lunch at the same time. At the back of the dining hall, a plant produces biogas with the organic waste. We started to use this uh, methane gas into our cooking house. Uh, so uh, there are a um, number of uh, the, uh, around 30 ton of uh, greenhouse gases uh, every year. We can avoid it by using this biogas plant. Bangladesh now has 145 green factories, 44 of which have achieved platinum status. Another extremely polluting industry is also moving in the right direction. Bangladesh is the world leader in ship recycling. One out of every two end-of-life ships in the world ends up on the great beach of Chittagong, where around 40 shipyards work to dismantle them, most of them without any respect for the environment or working conditions. Today, it is almost impossible for a journalist to go to one of these sites. The Owners' Association of the building sites sent out a circular with a very clear message. There is a risk that the safety of the construction sites is threatened by an outsider using a cell phone to take pictures discreetly. Under these circumstances, the construction site management is asked to give the necessary instructions to ensure that no foreigners can enter. Our intermediary, the local leader of the Independent Workers' Party, helped us make the illusion that we're foreign investors. Officially, we are here to see if it's possible to modernize the site. The boss is this man, in charge of the site. What they want to hide from the visitors is the total lack of environmental protection and safety measures for the workers. On this construction site, the oil seeps directly into the soil, and the asbestos, found in large quantities on the old boats, is managed in a totally irresponsible way. Asbestos <laughs> This is a condemned practice, as even if the sale of asbestos is not forbidden in Bangladesh, the asbestos waste must be treated. 
As for the workers who work here, they wear almost no protection. A lot of people enjoy the, somebody lose the hand, somebody lose the, uh, somebody lose, lose the leg, somebody is died. Every year on these so-called dirty building sites, about 20 workers die and hundreds more are injured. Only those who have nothing left to lose agree to testify. The able-bodied, if they speak out, are threatened with losing their jobs. Badrul, the leader of the Independent Workers' Party, takes us to meet a worker. Zawad worked for 30 years on different construction sites before his accident. Metal plates and screws are still in his lower limb. <laughs> Since the accident, Zawad has not received any help. Without resources, his son, who has recently started working on a dismantling site, provides for the family. But all hope is not lost for the workers. After weeks of negotiations, the only so-called clean site agreed to open its doors to us. Inside, another world. On the PHP site, respect for the environment and the well-being of the workers are pushed to the extreme. Mango trees, they will give mango four times a year. So all my people who work here will get mango four times a year, so they can eat any time they want. Jahi Rule is the director of the site. He is also the son of the owner, a businessman who invested $10 million to make it a model site. But it was not easy. A lot of the people used to work without uh, protective uh, gum boots. So they used to just come uh, wearing flip-flops. So when we started giving them uh, the boots, they said, it's very hot, we don't want to wear boots. We are very happy with uh, flip-flops. So we had to train them, we had to force them, and slowly over time, they understood the importance of wearing protective equipment and changing the habit. As for the site, it is entirely built on a gigantic, impermeable concrete slab. The hazardous materials collected are carefully listed on a table accessible to all, with the name of a specialist to contact in case of a problem. What kind of hazardous waste was generated last month? So. We glass wool, asbestos, paint chips, biomedical waste. So all type of waste will be uh, is written here. Each hazardous product is treated and stored in a dedicated room. Asbestos, batteries, or radioactive objects. To reduce work accidents. These are called magnetic cranes. And you can see that it can lift up to two tons very easily. Jahi Rule has mechanized the construction site to the maximum. Before, the transport of the metal blocks was done on the men's backs, and the site employed 3,000 workers, compared to 300 today. And if a worker is injured, they can go directly to the on-site medical clinic. 
Actually, PHP pays for all the workers' treatment, so it is uh, free of cost. Uh, they can uh, come and meet the doctor here whenever they want. It's free of cost. And also, every worker is insured from third-party insurance company. That is also only it's been done in PHP. The workers also have a mosque to pray in and a canteen. Most of them would never leave this job. Firefighting team nine, Amadari can a firefighting team as a city team as a can a shop piece of us. Kawadawa only breathing for Balo. Salary of Balo can a one of one at the cake and one at Balo. At PHP, the workers earn between thirty and forty per cent more. These modern construction sites and factories where wages are higher are actively participating in the emergence of a new middle class in the country. In the historical center of Dhaka, it's Tanvir's big night. The young man is waiting for hundreds of guests. Hello? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? An engineer in a textile factory, Tanvir belongs to this new middle class. After the wedding, his wife will come to live with him. According to tradition, the wedding bed must be perfect. They are decorating my bed and my room for this night. For my wife, she will be happy to see I organized and decorated from the regular day. After hugging his parents and receiving some sweets according to custom, Tanvir joins the reception room in a specially decorated carriage. But before meeting his future wife, he must wait a little longer. The father of the groom, surrounded by religious leaders, must agree on an official amount for the dowry. The clerics will now present the offer to the bride and her father. Her father encourages his daughter to accept it. According to tradition, the bride pretends to hesitate. The contract is signed, and the husband can finally meet his wife. It's a new journey of my life, and I'm very happy with him. My all dreams come true. She's still a medical student. With 700 euros per month, Tanvir already earns five times the average salary in the country. The salary runs also have a change from the previous and now uh, workers level also increased and so also top management also increased and overall totally increased and we are uh, also happy that day by day our production and our work order is uh, growing from other countries around, uh, around Bangladesh, basically from India and uh, Myanmar and Vietnam. These new middle and upper classes now have the means to consume more. In the north of Dhaka, in the up and coming districts, trendy stores and buildings with modern comforts are being built every day. Yes, 
Hossein is a real estate agent. Today, he will present his client, a lawyer married to a fighter pilot, one of the most beautiful apartments in his portfolio. Drawing, dining, family living. This is kitchen. dressing room. Dressing, master bathroom. The apartment is more than 300 square meters and surrounded by several balconies. Wow, it's beautiful. I can see the sky and the view. It makes me very happy. Beautiful. The client seems interested and asks about the price. Price is uh, Price is 24,000 per square feet. That's a total of 720,000 euros for this apartment. It's expensive, but at the moment, business is good. To convince his client, Hossein takes her to the roof. <laughs> the client is already imagining herself here. With 40 million people, the middle class of Bangladesh is now larger than the poor class. According to the World Bank, if nothing is done and temperatures continue to rise, Bangladesh will have over 13 million climate refugees by 2050.